you so much for clicking on this video. This is my Rhinchodendron Cabalgata in Verde. I bought it as Rhinchulalia digbiana crossed with Coilostylus ciliaris and through some forums I managed to get her identified as Rhinchodendron Cabalgata in Verde. Let me get something out of the way. If you have this orchid and you would like to join in on future updates, care collab videos regarding Rhinchodendron Cabalgata in Verde, please leave me a comment. Let me know you have this orchid so that we can then team up in the future for any kinds of videos, whatever it is information wise about this orchid that we want to put out. And I would be so happy to have company. For the time being though, I'm going to throw this video out in case anybody is wondering about its care. This is how I care for my Rhinchodendron Cabagata in Verde here in Southern Spain. And this is being filmed in the middle of November because she is in bloom. So if this video comes out at a specific month or you see it maybe six, eight months down the line, you know, mine is blooming in November. And these blooms have been open for over a week. I'm totally charmed by this orchid, even though the blooms are not sitting flat. Their presentation is claw-like and they always have been. I thought at first it was a first time blooming situation that the orchid itself needed to mature a little bit, but it wasn't. All the years that she's been with me and we're heading into year four, she has bloomed reliably and always with two blooms. So it's not as if this is first time blooming woes. This is her in my collection, how she presents herself. Initially, again, I thought that, well, I was hoping for more of a flatter presentation, just like her parents, for example, Rhinchulalia digbiana being one of them, as well as Coilostylus ciliaris, which used to be called Epidendrum ciliari. And we'll get to the parents. Both blooms on the parents present themselves flat. I happen to have gotten one that is presenting itself more in a claw shape. However, something about this has made me accept the fact that these blooms don't open out flat. And that is the beautiful coloration, the blush on the back of the sepals, just the sepals. The petals are white. So this contrast is absolutely, for me, the charm factor. You get to see them even if the bloom is facing you like that. I love it. I think it just adds to the whole interest of the orchid. You can also see in the bloom that gorgeous frilly lip that is inherited from Rhinchulalia digbiana. And then the star shape is the Echoilostylus ciliaris. So it has everything from the two parents presented beautifully. None of the parents, however, have any pink blush. So that just depends on which one you get, whether a Rhinchodendrum cabalgata in verde will open flat in its bloom and whether you get a blush or not. However, this orchid has a beautiful fragrance inherited from both parents. You can really recognize the Digbiana and the Ciliaris in there. Same fragrance, and it starts to permeate through the afternoon as the sun sets. That's when she becomes alive and active, just like her parents. It is a beautiful, elegant, rich citrus fragrance. There's a little bit of a powdery note, so it doesn't burn your nose as you smell it but it is certainly very, very strong. I wouldn't use the word pungent because pungent I associate with being unpleasant or too much. This is definitely not the case with this orchid. She is extremely elegant with her fragrance in the room, but know that it only happens late afternoon as the sun sets and then throughout the night. So if you have this orchid and you've been wondering about its fragrance and you don't think you have a fragrance, give it a sniff in the evening and you will probably be surprised how beautiful your orchid smells. In my case now, she is pretty mature. She's already had several divisions as well. So I don't have to go close to her to know who is actually fragrant. She is competing with other orchids I have currently in bloom, but it is very clear that she has this beautiful, rich, deep citrus fragrant, but it comes with a powdery note. Divine is all I can say. With regards to her parents, I happen to have them both. This is Rhinchulalia digbiana. And a side note, if you're seeing raindrops, then yes, it's raining. It's a monkey's wedding today. 
beautiful sunshine, but raining. And I'm just gonna continue filming because I don't see anything at this point that is going to affect my equipment. So, Rinkulelia digbiana, parent, one of them. Love this orchid, that's why I have her, and that's why I could have more crosses with regards to Rinkulelia digbiana. Coilostylis ciliaris. Also, clearly, I have this orchid because I love me white blooms, star-shaped, anything of that nature. Coilostylis ciliaris being the other parent, giving the rhincodendron cabalgata in verde the more finesse shape around the petals and sepals. Both parents equally have a great influence, 50-50, with regards to the cabalgata in verde bloom. That makes me happy. The only thing being, as you notice, both parents are bolt upright growers by nature. Now, if there is no light training, I can't tell you if any of the growths would go away from the pot. I do a lot of light training with regards to my new growths. It's working out great for me. But as you can see, both parents are bolt upright growers. The Rhincodendron, Cabagata and Verde, in my case, not so much, even though I do light training with her, as you can see with her previous growths. She does what she wants to do. She's a little bit of a yoga fanatic, I can see, but it's working out okay because even the newest growth that she's blooming on is leaning into the pot. Look at that from behind. Beautiful. Yeah, I don't mind her not being flat in her presentation. What I found with my orchid is that she grows two growths per year and one won't bloom and the second one will, which is fine with me. Every growth gives me a new set of roots, making the orchid stronger. Now I'm hoping, of course, that one year I will get bloomed back to back, but that is not the case with my orchid all these years down the line. As you can see, I grow in Lekka and self-watering. As I mentioned before, this is now November. She is in bloom, but I have stopped fertilizing because what she's going to do from here on in is go into snooze mode. She is going to take it much, much easier in the coming cooler months. She is a warm to hot grower. That is why I can now just back off on the fertilizer because she won't be growing any more new growth until probably about May when the first growth of the season starts which then won't bloom, and then she'll throw out another growth around July, and that is the one that then will bloom, hopefully, if nothing goes wrong in 2022. So my winter care currently is keep the leka damp, do not let my microfiber dry out, keep it damp so that the wicking efficacy of my leka does not deteriorate over the colder months of the year, but I do not have anything in my reservoir when I just flush her through with plain RO water. So she is not going to be starved. She has plenty of reserves to work with throughout the winter. And when she goes into snooze mode, she's not really going to be in need of any kind of fertilizer either. And once I see an eye swelling at the base, I will start to fertilize her straight away again at 300 parts per million for the remainder of the season because when it is go time with this one, it is go time. You can see that her structures are a little bit bendy. They're not as tough and strong as the Rincolalia digbiana, which I was hoping for. They certainly don't have the rigid effect as her other parent, the Coilostylis ciliaris. So 300 parts per million because I need these structures just to really bulk up. At least she consumes every part of those 300 parts per million because what I'm watching for is to not have any kind of mineral buildup on the surface of my pots, even though I have resident ferns in there. The resident ferns are in there because they help me with humidity levels through my very hot, dry summers. Now, this one doesn't need as such massive amounts of extra humidity, but my summers are very, very dry. I don't see any rain for seven months of the year and my humidity levels will drop to 30 if not less percent, but on an average 30 percent. So my setup is there to counteract my lack of humidity. Again, 300 parts per million straight in the pot. And once she's absorbed her reservoir, at that point in time, I do flush the pot before filling it up again with 300 parts per million. 
And that is all throughout the summer because she will then start on her second new growth, which I will cultivate with 300 parts per million up until the time that she is into her first week of blooming. And then I stop because I know we're back to the winter season and snooze mode kicks in. I have not had any pest issues with this orchid at all. If other orchids next to her had a little bit of sign of scale, they were dealt with promptly. Of course, preventative measures with her then kicked in. I wiped her down with some garlic alcohol, but it's not like there was a reoccurring problem with pests. I don't have to be so vigilant about it. What I have noticed is that she has really picked up on the sticky nature of any Coilostylus species. She throws out a lot of happy sap, which maybe you can see in the back here, results in like white scaly looking things. It, but that's happy sap from when her leaf was growing. And I find all Coilostylus or orchids that have Coilostylus as a parent, they throw out a lot of that stuff as they grow, which is great, which means she's getting hydrated. She grows a lot, a lot of sheaths as well. I mean, a lot. <laughs> this one is almost like double whammy when it comes to sheaths. Clearly every Cattleya type orchid has lots of sheaths at the base. And then the bulbs also have their own sheath. But what's happening here is that she gets two quite substantial structures, like a bulb split into half. So we have another sheath and another sheath. And she will, I have to tell you also, before she blooms, tease you with loads and loads of sheath as you think something is going to be happening in the leaf. So she develops a sheath within a sheath and eventually the blooms come out. Now this takes about oh, six weeks from seeing that sheath. It's a long process, literally. It's like having to wait for a Christmas present or you know, like pass the parcel, <laughs> that game, you put the gloves on, everybody has to play with the dice and then, you know, try and unwrap a present with all those impediments in the way and keep going. That is the effect that she gives me when I see all this happening inside the sheath and I'm all excited. I'm gonna see the blooms again and then it just takes a long, long time. So let it be, let it go. If you're considering whether she's going to bloom or not or if whatever is growing in the apex of the leaf is actually doing something, don't push it, let it be. You can also see that she starts her growth of the internal sheath way before the leaf even comes out and is fully matured. That's the nice thing about her. Now, what I will do now, because it is heading into very cold temperatures, I don't want my orchid to have a problem with rot or anything. So even though this sheath is immature, I'm gonna pull it back. She is in bloom, she can hold her own, but I'm pulling this outer sheath back despite the fact it's still green because I don't want the membrane to get wet and soggy and rot in the apex of the leaf here, which is something that can happen for any kind of Coilostylus, Cattleya or Lelia, especially if you're not in a climate that has heaters or heat mats, as in my case. This is just raw cultivating of the orchid based on the temperatures I have to work with. So as a protective measure, I pull down the sheath prematurely. Speaking of temperatures, when it comes into winter, my indoor temperatures can drop to 15 degrees Celsius. Being a warm and hot grower, that is her minimum in my opinion, because of course my setup provokes evaporative cooling because of the LECA. So I calculate like a differential of three degrees compared to what is my ambient temperature and what is in the pot. Three degrees meaning if I have a minimum temperature of 15 degrees Celsius, my guesstimate is that in the pot I have 12 degrees Celsius. That is borderline for this orchid, especially because the roots are always kept damp even throughout my cold winters. So my main concern in the winter is to not let the leka dry out, but not let her sit in a water-filled reservoir. In the summer, everything is super easy. I go full on ninja with regards to watering, flushing, and I leave the reservoir relatively full because of course her new growth is starting and my summer temperatures can vary between 25 degrees at night all the way up to 40 degrees during the day. 
40 degrees being extremely rare, but you know, at that time, that is her happy place. And that is when she really, really gets going in inverted commas because her structures do not grow fast, but at least in my case, for example, I get two. This is the time also when she starts to chuck out her roots. So new roots come just as the blooms open. And it is a big task for me to make sure that I find the balance, get it right, so that I can always have those roots maintain their health. I don't lose them. Anybody into root tips? There's one in there. Let's have a look. Root tips in between the leka. Ah, oh, gorgeous. Yeah, so keeping them damp, but making sure that the orchid as such isn't wet. So I do a lot of misting during the day, just a little bit around the surface of the pot, the outer edge, just to maintain the humidity, but not risk any kind of rot. So my winters, it really is a little bit of a game. What can I do depending on the temperature on that day and how much airflow I can allow into my dining room, which actually is my grow space. So during the winter, let's talk about her location. She is on the top shelf of my dining room where I have blurple lights, which I only supplement. I supplement lighting if I have a cloudy day. If I have a sunny day and the outdoor temperatures are around 17 degrees Celsius, that is when I move her outside to enjoy natural light. In the summer, she gets like eight or nine hours of super bright sun, not direct sun because in my climate, she has to live behind a white curtain to protect her from the heat of the sun because I don't get much airflow when it gets really, really hot. The east side is super protected as well from airflow. So I protect all the orchids located there with a white curtain, but imagine the amount of light that she gets. That's about eight to nine hours per day while the sun is still beating down on the east side of the patio and then continued light throughout the day because everything on my patio reflects white. So let me get back to making an invitation. If you have this orchid, let me know in the comments. Let me have some company on my next care video or update about this beautiful Rhincodendron Cavalgata in Verde. If you don't have this orchid, but you watched this video anyway, I hope that you enjoyed the blooms and that some of the information maybe inspired you to say, oh, I can grow this orchid and maybe you can source her and find her. But again, know that this is not the norm, so to speak, with regards to the coloration of the sepals. It is also not the norm that the flower shape is a claw shape. Normally, what I've seen on the interwebs is that these blooms do present themselves flat and they're all more of a cream color. I happen to like my variation. I've gotten used to it. My first year was a little bit like, oh dear, what's going on? And now I've just gotten used to it. I love, love the contrast that these blooms give me when I can see them from all sides without having to move the orchid at all. I really hope that you found this interesting. And now it's really going to rain, so everybody has to come inside. Otherwise, I'm going to be in trouble. We are going into cooler temperatures. So, quick thank you. Doesn't mean I don't appreciate your time so much watching this video. Please, please have yourselves a beautiful day on one condition that you stay safe and take care. Bye. Oh, but it is so pretty with the raindrops. <laughs> I love it.